So, good afternoon. We're going to start the session on fisheries management. As you know, Professor Pauli um, had some um, health issues. Unfortunately, he's not able to be with us here, so, and he's very sorry about that, of course. But we would like to thank him uh, so very much for being available to speak with us a video, um, through video conference. Uh, it's all very technical. We're all hoping fervently that this goes well, <laughs> and uh, we hope for your cooperation. So, uh, Professor Pauli, uh, thank you so much for joining us, and I believe everybody is extremely anxious for your talk, so yes. take it away. Okay, uh, hello. I'm glad to, to have been able to hobble here. Uh, get, let's get out, this out of the way. The health issue is that I have a bad back. A really bad back and my legs my, my leg hurts and I cannot walk so uh, that's the health issue don't worry and it's not catching uh, you don't have to worry about catching <laughs> so um, I will talk I will present to you the impact of fisheries and global warming on marine ecosystems and uh, uh, what I will present to you is uh, stuff that we have uh, well published so any of you will be able to follow up on with me uh, by email. Uh, and the story starts with, um, let's see, we can start it in, uh, in 2001, when we established that uh, uh, the catch, the fisheries catch of the world uh, is actually not increasing, was actually not increasing anymore, but decreasing. Uh, red, in red you see the increase that was suggested by uh, the data in FAO, where everybody, the countries uh, that are member countries, uh, send the data. And the blue line was after we had corrected for the for over-reporting by China. Uh, the reason why China over-reports uh, are not interesting for, for the time being, but uh, they do. And uh, they still do, actually, the domestic catch. And uh, you can see the descending trend uh, once we have removed the Peruvian and Choveta much better. And this trend has actually continued. And uh, this decline, <coughs> decline uh, takes place, the decline of global fisheries catch in the face of a tremendous increase of fishing capacity and uh, that is taking place mainly in Asia but also in Europe. This represents uh, the effective fishing effort uh, in, this is actually fishing capacity, but uh, it, it is uh, increase the fishing capacity in uh, uh, kilowatt, uh, in power, engine power, uh, cumulative uh, over all classes of engine, uh, is uh, multiplied by about 2% per year because of technology improvement. And you see that uh, there is a rapid increase, even in Europe, even though boats are retired because of uh, technology, GPS and so on. And another important feature, or one that I will detail uh, in, uh, uh, in the course of this uh, presentation, is that uh, fish have been expanding. This expansion can be uh, presented by way of plotting the catch in space. And uh, here's an example uh, that I have presented several years ago. Uh, Spain in 2000, uh, 2004 contrasted with Spain in, two, in 1950. You see this expansion uh, of the Spanish catch. Now, uh, Spain should not be, uh, is, not an ex is, an except, is not an exception in this. The same kind of map can be done with Japan, the France, or any of the distant water fishing countries. Basically, the pattern is that uh, before, countries with distant water fleet were fishing in the neighboring water, and then they have expanded. And, uh, but we can, we can represent that much better, because uh, a ton of, uh, of tuna is not the same ecologically as a ton of, um, of sardine. You cannot add them up. It would be like adding, adding a lion and a gazelle, or, a, or even a cow and grass because they are different trophic levels. So we, we have to have a common currency uh, if we want to compare well uh, 
the impact on ecosystem. And the common currency is simply the phytoplankton production needed to sustain, uh, to sustain a catch. If you catch a ton of uh, tuna at trophic level four, it implies that uh, uh, 10 tons of, of, um, of uh, prey fish, say sardine, were consumed by the tuna. And it implies that uh, about uh, 100 tons of zooplankton was available and so on. So basically, if you, then, if you use the trophic level of the fish that are caught and re-express them as primary production, you can then uh, add all the primary production required by the various fisheries. And uh, if you want to plot this uh, spatially, you then express this primary production as primary production, as fraction of the primary production uh, that is locally occurring. And if we do that, uh, we see that uh, uh, levels of 30% uh, of primary production being used for fisheries were, were only occurring around uh, Northern Europe, where fisheries were industrialized first. So there, was, there were fisheries uh, everywhere, but only in Northern Europe was the intensity of fishing such that 30% of the primary production was used for the fishery the, in red. Now, if you, if you zip through 60 years, you then have a situation where the, the utilization of the sea is uh, immense. And you see that there are vast regions of the ocean where 30% or 20% are are used uh, uh, for, the, for the fisheries. Now, the transition from this to this is, uh, has been occurring over uh, this, the, the, the years, and this can be represented, uh, the transition, uh, as a, a growth, of, uh, as an expansion, and the, the area, the new areas, the areas where 10%, where, where 20%, 20%, and 30% of prime production use uh, can, be, can be shown here. And you can see that about 1 million ton per year, 1 million square kilometer per year, is the rate of growth in the first 30 years after 1950. And then in the, it increased in, uh, in, uh, in the 80s and 90s, and now it's almost zero. So another way of representing this is through this graph. You can see that uh, the, the rate of growth of the, these uh, areas that were ten, where we use 10%, 20%, or 30% of prime production is more or less uh, constant, but it increased very much in the 80s. And the 80s, you will remember, is the time when uh, the in the early 80s, when the uh, United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea was declared. That is when it was not possible anymore to simply go uh, to another country and water. And uh, this, um, um, at this attempt, this, uh, for example, Portugal could not fish anymore in Newfoundland waters because Canada declared uh, uh, an exclusive economic zone, and Japan could not fish anymore in U.S. waters, and so on. And uh, therefore, they had to exploit the high sea more intensively, and uh, in the high seas, you, you don't have much fish, it's very dilute, and so the rate of expansion accelerated, but then it became flat because there is not much space to expand into. And you, this expansion occurred also in depth, and on the right, or sorry, on the, on the left, is a graph that was produced by Telmo Morato you, of, uh, of uh, University of the Azores, and uh, on, on the right uh, a graph that was uh, produced recently uh, in, uh, on a paper, by a paper on expansion, the one I cited before, and uh, you can see that uh, the new areas that in each decade is, uh, was uh, expanded into uh, using the 10%, the 20%, or the 
uh, private production required threshold uh, increase uh, or is moving south. And it's moving south very regularly at a very rapid rate. That means uh, the rate of about 0.8 degree uh, uh, latitude per year. And uh, that means that uh, we can uh, project this line and uh, when we can uh, uh, estimate the year where all our research vessels will be in Antarctica fishing krill. And this is uh, almost, this sounds like an exaggeration, but it is, uh, if you look where the fisheries development occur right now, it's in a Ross Sea, it's in Antarctica. And the other fisheries are, are not developing, they are uh, going down slowly. And a representation of this uh, situation uh, can be given that uh, by uh, a collection of pictures that a colleague of ours, uh, Lauren McLanahan, has identified um, in the archives in Florida. In Florida, they have uh, so-called day boats where you can, uh, when you can uh, get a ticket on a on a boat that goes out from a, a pier, from a from a certain place to uh, a certain place that is a radius of about ten miles, and the fi the biggest fish that you catch is going to be shown on that pier, on that uh, at that place, that very place, and you can see that the fish caught in fifty six in this case where uh, enormous groupers, they're almost as big as uh, this child and uh, bigger, as big as the person actually. And uh, these were the biggest caught in 56. This was the biggest caught in 80. Same place, same fishing uh, method, same boat, same, it's the same boat actually. And you see that they catch middle-sized fish. These are the biggest caught in a day. And these are the biggest caught in 2007. This is an example of what has happened. Uh, and uh, the weight, actually, is very similar. You could, you could say uh, the weight is actually similar, but uh, you need far more fish to get to that weight. And you can see that uh, the community has totally changed. It has to totally changed in shape. And I will get back to that. Uh, uh, a summary of this is being presented also in the press. These pictures are well known in the meantime. Uh, this is the, the, the story uh, of obesity and the story of fisheries on the same, on the same graph. You see that, right? Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, this is also a story about... about uh, shifting baseline because actually the big guy today is also happy he is also happy because he doesn't he doesn't he doesn't know about the past and he, he doesn't care about the past and he doesn't know that he's losing out he doesn't know what he could have caught earlier so what is the effect of all this fishing and uh, uh, we have recently um, applied uh, an ecosystem model, a simplified ecosystem model, it's called Ecotroph, not Ecopath, but Ecotroph, to all the world, uh, uh, the world uh, cells. We, we have little half degree cells. And uh, the conclusion was that about 13% of the biomass has been removed from the ocean. From trophic level, uh, 3.5 and up, 3.5 and up. However, 45% has been removed from the ocean. When we look at the high seas versus the EEZ, 200 miles, uh, we can see that uh, far more has been removed in uh, within the EEZ because most fishing fishing is coastal, and about 50% of the large predators of 3.5 and up uh, trophic level have been removed. And when you, when you compare different ocean, you see that about 80% have been removed 
of the large predators in the North Atlantic and the North Pacific, and the other oceans are following later. They are following later because we are moving south only later. We have uh, started in the North Atlantic and the North Pacific earlier. So basically, you, you see again the transition that I was talking about uh, in, uh, toward the south, you see it also. And this, uh, this uh, paper that was published <coughs> in Maps, uh basically confirms uh, some of the uh, publications that were uh, produced earlier that uh, argued for the fact that uh, the large predators in the sea have been decimated. And in fact, uh, more than decimated, because decimated meant every tenth soldier was killed. And that, that's, that's, every, uh, that's eight uh, of ten in that case. Um, uh, when represented on the, as a map with uh, the large predator uh, uh, depletion, you can see that the large predator de were depleted in the 50s already. This is not all fish, 0%. This is the large predators, and uh, may, now they, are, they have very depleted. Now, this map is not precise, and the, the difference between 0 and 10% cannot be seen with the eye, really. And therefore, there will be much argument about this map. But basically, the large predators have gone from large region of the world. And, uh, and uh, another... This leads to fishing down, and now those of you that want to sleep uh, can uh, sleep because it's already five o'clock in the afternoon at your place, right? And uh, I will present you something called replication. Uh, in uh, 98, um, 1998, we showed that uh, the trophic level, the mean trophic level of the catch was declining throughout the world. And uh, this uh, was easy to do. You can uh, easily uh, compute the mean trophic level of the catch uh, because in fish base, that you might know, uh, you can get the trophic level of the fish, that uh, of any fish that you want, and you can uh, multiply it with the catch and you can easily compute the time series of mean trophic level. And so lots of people have done it. And I will now show you lots of cases and for a specific reason. So that's going to be the boring part of this presentation. Uh, on the west coast of Canada, for example, uh, we, we see a decline of trophic level from 1900. Uh, on the east coast of Canada, we see a rapid decline in the 90s when a cod collapse. On the U.S. Uh, mid-Atlantic coast, we see uh, a rapid decline also in the 80s, but uh, a, a slow decline in uh, Chesapeake Bay. Uh, that is a, a, an important uh, area uh, of uh, the so-called mid-Atlantic coast of the U.S. because the fishing had uh, begun earlier there. So uh, basically, trophic level were lower there to start with. And in Cuba, uh, we have a, a very neat demonstration of trophic level declining. Again, I, I told you that we, is it boring? I have to continue a few more. Uh, in Brazil, uh, each state in Brazil, uh, in northern Brazil, shows this, uh, this decline, but uh, it shows it only after you disaggregate the data at state level. If you pull them together, uh, it doesn't show anything. Uh, Argentina, Uruguay, you see the same decline. I'm almost done. In Peru, you see that uh, decline uh, uh, very rapid uh, if you take all fish. Uh, it happened in the 50s when they began uh, transiting from a fishery for tuna to a fishery for anchove, for anchoveta. And, well, yeah. and if, you, if you take all fish but the anchoveta, you get the blue and the, the, the green line, and it also goes down. And in India, another one, all states of India, India has states, uh, 
uh, show a decline. A Mauritania, a decline. Iceland, a decline. And so, my surprise, when last year uh, a big paper was published in Nature that uh, fishing down doesn't happen. And you see this, uh, this, uh, uh, this various uh, newspapers article. So basically, the author said, uh, this is happening, or it's not happening. Uh, for example, uh, somebody here talks about, it is arrogant to claim that uh, fishing down happens when the, the data don't show that. The data that I've just shown you. Uh, in the Gulf of Thailand, says somebody here, uh, the fisheries targeted mussels at first, and, and then they moved up, up the food web. So there was an increase, not a decrease. But actually, in the Gulf of Thailand, the fishery uh, began, the industrial fishery, began in the 60s um, with a catch per effort of about 300 kilograms per hour catching big fish like, uh, like I showed you for Florida. And uh, within a, a few years, actually two decades, it, uh, it caught small fish and had a, 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 the, um, had a catch per effort of about 20 kilograms per hour. The catch, the catch per effort actually declined by a factor of more than 20, uh, because the graph continues uh, beyond what is shown here. In other words, in the Gulf of Thailand, the fishery did not proceed from mussels to, to fish because, because mussels and crabs at the, in the coast and uh, big fish uh, offshore were not the same fishery. And, and if you look at uh, the, the, the trophic level of, uh, of uh, Thailand, uh, indeed it, continue, it went down and uh, it didn't go up first because the, the catch uh, of uh, mussels really was a, a different fishery. Uh, this was not actually even a fishery. Uh, in the Gulf of Thailand, you can also simulate uh, what happened and you, you will see that uh, the trophic level declines. And the, somebody also said that, uh, that uh, the fishing down process is simply not supported by data. But what I showed you uh, were actually data. Uh, lots of people, uh, many working with me, but many not working with me, finding <coughs> fishing down all over the place. Uh, and uh, the idea that fishermen generally sequentially deplete food web is not supported by data. Well, actually, in the Gulf of Maine, uh, that is uh, in the U.S. north of Boston, you, you can reconstruct what people have fished over millennia, because even before Europe arrived, people were exploiting uh, the resource there. And uh, before Europe arrived, they were operating at trophic level four about, because they were eating mainly uh, marine mammal and big animals. And then it went, uh, that was the first phase. The, that is not shown. Then phase two was uh, exporting fish until the whole thing collapsed in the 80s. The, again, the cod collapsed. And then they, they fished sea urchins. Sea urchin, eriso, no? they, they, they fish sea urchin. And then there was a sea cucumber fishery that began and then a seaweed fishery. fishery. So this, uh, this, uh, this uh, is a beautiful example of uh, humans uh, taking the best part of the ecosystem first, and then the next best, and then the next best, and then at the end, scraping the bottom. This is not necessarily noted by uh, fishermen because because they, 
they don't get old. Well, they do get old, but not old enough to know what uh, the, the grandpa parents had caught. So you can have a situation where people uh, are perfectly happy fishing seaweed or sea cucumbers and uh, claiming that the system has always been like that. Yeah. So the claim that uh, the situation has improved and there is no more uh, fishing down uh, is actually uh, is actually contradicted by the very same graph that uh, the people uh, generated. Because if you look at uh, high uh, fish high in the food web, they do continue, even in their own paper, to decline. So uh, we will uh, forget uh, the claim that fishing down does not happen. It actually is a very strong effect of fishing. And this, uh, this is what happens, that the very thing that you have seen in Florida uh, in these uh, three pictures, uh, the fisheries, uh, as summarized, the fisheries concentrate on big fish first, then medium fish, then small fish. In a process, because we use trawl, it modifies the habitat. And as it modifies the habitat, which is populated by short-lived animals, it generates another food web, another condition. And these conditions are conducive to, among other things, to the emergence of, uh, of uh, uh, jellyfish. We have uh, conducted a study uh, recently that is available to anybody who writes me. Uh, uh, it's published in Hydrobiology that demonstrate that in uh, the majority, uh, overwhelming majority of large marine ecosystems in the world have uh, an explosion, have seen an increase uh, of uh, events, uh, uh, of, of events uh, where jellyfish uh, take over the, the system in question. The best known system where that has been taken over the, the, by jellyfish is obviously the Black Sea and uh, the Namibian upwelling ecosystem, the Benguela. But uh, southern Japan is also uh, haunted by this uh, large jellyfish explosion. And the reason why, one, one reason why this happens is that basically we have eliminated all the, the fish and the turtles. This is not the right turtle in this drawing, but we have eliminated the turtles that eat jellyfish. We have also eliminated adult jellyfish, eliminated the many of the small fish that predate, that prey on the larvae. And we have also eliminated many of the competitors and predators of the, of the polyps of jellyfish. So all phase of the life cycle uh, of jellyfish are doing better. We have also obviously modified habitat, increased construction site, increased concrete uh, on coast, along coastline uh, where polyps can grow. But uh, this is uh, the result of this study. Uh, in, uh, it says are documented in a paper now published, now submitted. This is the old slide I should have written, uh, now published. And uh, a GBLT uh, in the corner here is a joke. It is uh, uh, a jellyfish uh, bacon and lettuce sandwich. Uh, <laughs> you, uh, yeah. It's one of my students did it, and she got, uh, this was published in science, actually. Um, uh, you get published in science for the weirdest things. Now, <laughs> yeah. Well, in the meantime, things are heating up. As you know, um, uh, when this uh, when this slice was made, uh, the various when this slide was made uh, about six years ago, the <clears throat> the scenario that uh, green and uh, violet here, uh, <clears throat> the optimistic scenario uh, looked realistic. Uh, in the meantime, the red line is uh, what we're doing, and so this is uh, really. 
uh, getting to be a problem. As you well know, uh, we can demonstrate that uh, empirically that the distribution of fish is shifting uh, northward in the northern hemisphere, southward in the southern hemisphere. This is well documented. I'm sure in Portugal you have lots of fish that occurred off northwest Africa before. Uh, in England they have lots of fish that occurred in Portugal before and so on. I here in British Columbia we have uh, Humboldt squid, uh, uh, jumbo squid uh, that uh, occurred in Mexico before. Uh, we have lots of species that fishers don't know and that is uh, because they shift north and they shift north because they have to maintain the temperature. If you, if you look at the map uh, of uh, a fish, uh, for example, this uh, croaker, and uh, it occurs uh, uh, in northern Taiwan and all the way to Korea and the East China Sea, South Korea. It doesn't occur in, Japan, in Japan's water and uh, it, occurs, uh, it doesn't occur in North Korea and in Japan. And because of the distribution map, we have created it. Uh, uh, we have one map like this for every fish species that is commercially reported uh, to FAO. Uh, uh, we can infer the temperature distribution, the distribution of temperature that uh, the map represents. And we can see that this fish really likes temperature of 15 degree and uh, the the rapidly that it declines very rapidly on uh, on uh, lower than 12 degree and higher than 18 degree mm -hmm. so this central temperature is the one that the fish has to be in and if the temperatures are shifting the fish will have to move the 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 fish will have to move because otherwise uh, as you know, uh, fish cannot regulate the temperature, at least uh, most of them, and uh, they, they, uh, they will die. So th they do not optimize uh, uh, the, the life uh, choosing between uh, abundant food and, and correct temperature. They have to follow the temperature, and then they hope to, uh, to get uh, the food that they need where the temperature is right. So basically, you can make them follow the temperature by uh, putting a little model in each cell, half degree cell, which uh, produce a little population dynamics model, which produce larvae, where the population produce larvae, which go in all direction, depending on, on the current that flows. Uh, we have data on that. And uh, 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 depending on whether the larvae uh, encounter a uh, the temperature within a range that they can handle, the population will 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 reproduce itself. If 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 it the temperature is not right, then the fish will uh, not reproduce itself. So if you if you use temperature fields that change with uh, with time, and we receive such uh, temperature fields from simulation of our colleagues it, at Princeton University, then you can generate a, a, a history of what this fish is likely to do. And uh, we, can, uh, we can see that uh, the fish actually moves north and it moves also deep to deeper water. And we can see that this fish uh, doesn't occur in Taiwan anymore that uh, it occurs in uh, North Korea and in the Bohai Sea in northern China, where it didn't before, and uh, a little bit in, in southern Japan, where it didn't occur before. So basically, this is what uh, reproduce the, uh, this can reproduce the, 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 the movement uh, of fish that are really observed and we get, on the average, the same uh, rate of movement that are observed, the, a few 50 kilometers per decade or something like that. So basically, we know that this works. So we reproduce this for all species that we have uh, that are in catch statistics. 
all species in Kachas is about 1,500. And what we get is uh, this, this result. Uh, and it was the first map, global map, of, of, of this kind. Uh, this had been done for land-based plant, and actually uh, we imitated, uh, we, we copied, in a sense, the approach used for terrestrial uh, animals. Basically, there are lots of invasion uh, into the Arctic and Antarctica, and uh, because invasion then is a, a species that come where it was not before. And lots of local extinction, that is, a, a cell where it was before, where it has ceased to be, local extinction. And we express this local extinction uh, relative to the fish that are already there, so we can uh, compute the turnover. And you will see that uh, there are lots of extinction in, uh, in Antarctica, and that's all the fish that, uh, that are tied to the ice. Uh, because lots of fish in Antarctica have a stage that is tied to the ice. And if the ice disappears, I, also you can see a band in the tropics of, uh, of, um, of extinction. That is the fish that cannot handle the high temperature and leave and uh, move uh, away from the tropics. And each species that move carries with it uh, a catch potential. Imagine cod, bacalao. If it moves into the Arctic or from, from uh, uh, say, Iceland to northern Greenland, then a new population developed there, it will be fishable. It has a, a fish, it has a catch potential. So basically, if we express the catch potential as a function of the previous catch of that species, and we can uh, we can see what uh, what becomes of the of the catch potential of the world, and we can see that uh, the biggest change occurs in Antarctica, because all Antarctic species will be gone, and there is no species that coming from elsewhere that replaces them, uh, because essentially because the species from South America, South Africa, uh, and Australia cannot jump to Antarctica. That is essentially the reason. And the tropics are the next big extinct, uh, zone of depletion. And because essentially the 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 are <coughs> that uh, when species disappear, there is no other species coming to replace them. And uh, of Portugal and and. Uh, for example, there is no change because, uh, in total, because uh, for every species that uh, moves away, there is another one that comes from Africa. But uh, if you go further south to the to the um, to the uh, to the equator, you have this problem, and you can see also the extinction, uh, the the big change. In, in a closed area, like the Black Sea, the Persian Gulf, and so on, where the fish cannot move. So we can also present this last result in terms of, uh, in terms of an increase in, uh, in, uh, for some countries in uh, low latitude and a decrease of catch in high latitudes. And this is... Uh, a, uh, a big problem, a big problem that is coming, because um, this is exactly the same pattern that we will see for agriculture. So basically we are talking about food security for billions of people being affected. And the role of fisheries uh, is not very big, though much bigger than we think, but but especially the tropic will be hit very hard. And I hope all of you are aware that right now we, we are deriving lots of our fish actually from the tropics. Because of this uh, movement of fisheries, uh, we are deriving lots of food in Europe from, uh, 
from developing countries of the tropical zones. And we can see, and that I'm almost done, we can see um, that uh, this simulation suggests that we will, uh, certain countries will benefit uh, on, on the middle term, on the short term and the middle term. For example, Norway, Greenland, Alaska will see more fish. Um, and uh, there will not be a decline right away. Uh, on the other hand, tropical countries like Indonesia, uh, which, which are uh, really on the tropics, uh, will see a massive decline of their fishery. Uh, it will not be possible, though, to, when a stock disappears, to say that is because of over, over or of global warming, because uh, Indonesia, for example, I have worked there in the 70s, uh, has thousands and thousands of stocks, has no documentation of the fisheries, and and uh, has lots of local overfishing, and it will not be possible to say why this fish has disappeared. Is, is it too much fishing? Is it Global warming will not be possible, but it will happen. And you could say this is bad enough, but actually, and that is my last slide, actually a little bit of physiology will show that it is only half of the story. Uh, fish, water breathers in general, uh, they have gills, and uh, these gills uh, the water, the sorry, are perfused with water, and uh, the oxygen gets in through the gills. Now this is a surface. A surface doesn't grow as fast as a volume. So the bigger a fish gets, the smaller the the body, the gill area per body weight is. There is no way the fish can do anything about it. It can have big gills, but it is a surface, it, and it has to function as such. So, as, as the fish get bigger, there will always be a size at which the gill area per body weight is just enough to bring enough oxygen for, for the maintenance metabolism. And that's the reason why fish at some point, cannot grow. On the average, they, that's the maximum size. And I, I showed this in W infinity one. And, and, and you can define uh, the growth, uh, the scope for growth, K1, as the difference between the gill line and uh, the maintenance metabolism. And if the temperature is low, the maintenance metabolism will be low, and the fish can get big. Now, if you increase the temperature, again, uh, and the fish cannot leave, we've talked about that, what happens? Well, the metabolism goes up, and the K1 declines, that's the growth potential, the oxygen that is available for growth, as opposed to maintenance metabolism. That means the fish has to remain smaller, and that basically is a reason why fish, uh, why, why there is a relationship between size, the maximum size a fish can reach, and temperature. If, if a fish can handle a low temperature, it can get bigger in this. If you don't believe it, uh, start an experiment today with uh, guppies. You know this little fish? Uh, and you put some at 15 degrees, some at 18, and some at 20. And you will see, and I bet you, uh, a big sum of uh, whatever, peanuts, that uh, uh, the, the one at lower temperature will grow bigger. They will take longer, but they will grow bigger. And this is because of that. Now, what it means is uh, the, the, temperature, the oxygen level of the sea also will change. Because as you warm the ocean, it becomes more stratified. 
uh, the essentially the surface waters become uh, warmer, becomes lighter, and uh, becomes more difficult to turn around to mix with a deeper water. So the future ocean is profoundly stratified, uh, is strongly stratified, and it is more difficult to break the stratification for winds and storm and so on, to break the stratification. That means there will be more areas with less oxygen. And we know from before that the fish have to be where the temperature is right for them. If there is little oxygen where the temperature is right for them, that means the habitat has shrunk. And such habitat shrinking are, uh, is uh, well documented, for example, from the, from the Baltic Sea, where the, the, the oxygen and temperature uh, combination that is uh, suitable for fish is getting smaller and smaller. It's also happening in an open pelagic system for, uh, at present, for large pelagic fish, they call it a, 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 a range compression. And uh, there are lots of studies being done now that, uh, that suggest that tuna are already being affected by compression of the range uh, that they can inhabit. And uh, this is not considered, this was not considered in, uh, in, uh, in the prediction that, uh, that I made here. Uh, that we made here, and uh, we we are working on considering this, and uh, this all accelerates and accentuates uh, the the effects of global warming and the effect of uh, migration uh, that are induced at temperature. So basically, that's a story that I wanted to tell: the effect of uh, of fishing are manifesting themselves in, uh, obviously, in a decline of biomass, a uh, decline in catches, a uh, decline in biomass, and a uh, and, uh, decline in the structure of the ocean uh, toward smaller animals that have lower trophic levels, contrary to uh, what uh, uh, some people say at the University of Washington, this process is actually happening. This is, combined, this is combined with uh, uh, the effect of temperature, of changing temperature, and altogether, this doesn't look good. So, basically, you have, we have to deal with the consequences and, uh, and uh, try to mitigate this. And basically, for the mitigation, we're talking about the same thing that you have heard again and again. We have to reduce fishing effort. We have to set up marine protected areas to recover the population uh, of fish so that they are, they are bigger, they are more resilient, and they can, uh, they can generate some of the uh, variability, some of the variance in their features uh, that uh, they can somehow adapt a little bit and resist this, uh, this physiological change that are coming in addition to this. But altogether, these various things will only buy us time. Uh, essentially, what we must do is, uh, is uh, get rid of this increase of uh, climate change and of greenhouse gas emission. Uh, but that, again, is another story. Um, that would be it. I'm, I'm through with it. Uh, that uh, work, uh, you can imagine what I presented you is always covered an immense scope, and uh, I cannot do it by myself, and I don't. Uh, uh, there are lots of people here, uh, my students and my assistants and, uh, and uh, people who help, and here they are. And uh, you're welcome to write us if you want uh, papers or, or advice. And uh, I will be glad to respond to your questions. Thank you very much. of prime production use uh, can, be, can be shown here. And you can see that about one million ton per year, one million square kilometer per year, 
is the rate of growth in the first 30 years after 1950, and then in the, it increased in the, in, the, in the 80s and 90s, and now it's almost zero. So another way of representing this is through this graph. You can see that uh, the, the rate of growth of the, these uh, areas that well, ten, where we use 10%, 20%, or 30% of prime production is more or less uh, constant, but it increased very much in the 80s. And the 80s, you will remember, is the time when uh, the, in the early 80s, when the uh, United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea was declared. That is when it was not possible anymore to simply go uh, to another country and water. And uh, this, um, um, at this attempt, this, uh, for example, Portugal could not fish anymore in Newfoundland waters because Canada declared uh, uh, an exclusive economic zone and Japan could not fish anymore in US waters and so on. And uh, therefore they had to exploit the high sea more intensively and uh, in the high seas, you, you don't have much fish, it's very dilute. And so the rate of expansion accelerated, but then it became flat because there is not much space to expand into. And you, this expansion occurred also in uh, the data in FAO, where everybody, the countries uh, that are member countries, uh, send their data and the blue line was after we had corrected for the for over-reporting by China. Uh, the reason why China over-reports uh, are not interesting for, for the time being, but uh, they do. And uh, they still do, actually, the domestic catch. And uh, you can see the descending trend uh, once we have removed the Peruvian and Choveta much better. And this trend has actually continued. And... Uh, this decline, <coughs> decline uh, takes place, the decline of global fisheries catch in the face of a tremendous increase of fishing capacity and uh, that is taking place mainly in Asia but also in Europe. This represents uh, the effective fishing effort uh, in, this is actually fishing capacity, but uh, it, it is uh, increase the fishing capacity in uh, uh, kilowatt uh, in power, engine power, uh, cumulative uh, over all classes of engine, uh, is uh, multiplied by about 2% per year because of technology improvement. And you see that uh, there is a rapid increase, even in Europe, even though boats are retired because of uh, technology, GPS and so on. And Another important feature, or one that I will detail uh, in, uh, uh, in the course of this uh, presentation, is that uh, fish have been expanding. This expansion can be uh, presented by way of plotting the catch in space. And uh, here's an example uh, that I have presented several years ago. Uh, Spain in 2000, uh, 2004, contrasted with Spain in 1950. You see this expansion uh, of the Spanish catch. Now, uh, Spain should not be, uh, is, not an ex is, an except is not an exception in this. The same kind of map can be done with Japan, the France, or any of the distant water fishing countries. Basically, the pattern is that uh, before, countries with distant water fleet were fishing in the neighboring water, and then they have expanded. And, uh, but we can, we can represent that much better because uh, a ton of, uh, of tuna is not the same ecologically as a ton of, um, of sardine. You cannot add them up. It would be like adding, adding a lion and a gazelle or, a, or even a cow and grass because they are different trophic levels. So we we have to have a common currency uh, if we want to compare well uh, the impact on ecosystem. And the common currency is simply the phytoplankton production needed to sustain, uh, 
to sustain a catch. If you catch a ton of uh, tuna at trophic level four, it implies that uh, uh, 10 tons of, of, um, of uh, prey fish, say sardine, were consumed by the tuna. And it implies that uh, about uh, 100 tons of zooplankton was available and so on. So basically, if you then, if you use the trophic level of the... So, good afternoon. We're going to start the session on fisheries management. As you know, Professor Pauli um, had some um, health issues. Unfortunately, he's not able to be with us here, so, and he's very sorry about that, of course. But we would like to thank him. Uh, so very much for being available to speak with us a video um, through video conference. Uh, it's all very technical. We're all hoping fervently that this goes well, and um, we hope for your cooperation. So, uh, Professor Pauli, uh, thank you so much for joining us, and I believe everybody is extremely anxious for your talk. So yes. take it away. Okay. Uh, hello. I'm glad to to have been able to hobble here. Uh, get, let's get out, this out of the way. The health issue is that I have a bad back, a really bad back, and my legs, my, my leg hurts, and I cannot walk. So uh, that's the health issue, don't worry. And it's not catching. Uh, you don't have to worry about <laughs> catching. So um, I, will talk, I will present to you the impact of fisheries and global warming on marine ecosystems. And uh, uh, what I will present to you is uh, stuff that we have uh, well published, so any of you will be able to follow up on with me uh, by email. Uh, and the story starts with, um, let's see, we can start it in, uh, in 2001, when we established that uh, uh, the catch, the fisheries catch of the world uh, is actually not increasing, was actually not increasing anymore, but decreasing. Uh, red, in red you see the increase that was suggested by fish that are caught, and re-express them as primary production. You can then uh, add all the primary production required by the virus fisheries. And uh, if you want to plot this uh, spatially, you then express this primary production as primary production as fraction of the primary production uh, that is locally occurring. And if we do that, uh, we see that uh, uh, levels of 30% uh, of primary production being used for fisheries were, were only occurring around uh, Northern Europe, where fisheries were industrialized first. So there, was, there were fisheries uh, everywhere, but only in Northern Europe was the intensity of fishing such that 30% of the primary production was used for the fishery the, in red. Now, if you, if you zip through 60 years, you then have a situation where the, the utilization of the sea is uh, immense. And you see that there are vast regions of the ocean where 30% or 20% are, are use uh, uh, for, the, for the fisheries. Now, the transition from this to this is, uh, has been occurring over uh, this, the, the, the years, and this can be represented, uh, the transition, uh, as a, a growth, of, uh, as an expansion, and the, the Area, the new areas, the areas where, where 10%, 20%, and 